Today we are going to be going over Genesis chapter 12, verses 10 through 20. I have entitled this lesson, Deception in Egypt. So to set the stage before we move on to the story, this has happened immediately after the verses that we considered last week, where Abram is given the promise for land, for children, and is told that he will be a blessing to every nation. And this story drops in after that as this sort of interlude that isn't expected in any way. You can't really see this story coming. Um, and if you have never read this story before, don't be surprised. It does not appear in any cycle of lectionary readings for Sunday worship. And there are probably good reasons for this. After all, aren't we meant to look to the scriptures for moral exemplars and examples of righteous living? But not every story teaches us in the same way. Sometimes we see in a story better ways to live as the characters walk in wisdom or discover wisdom along the way. But sometimes a story teaches us what not to do or how not to act. And this is one such story. And what sometimes makes people uncomfortable and why it's probably left out of lectionaries is that it's Father Abraham, or in this story, Abram, who is the character who comes off in the least favorable light. So let's start with verse 10, Genesis 12, verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to reside there as an alien, for the famine was severe in the land. First, let's hold on, pump the brakes. What is this? Abram was only just has only just arrived at the promised land, and now he's found it unsuitable for life. Fre Freetham writes in the Harper Study Bible Commentary, the promise of the land has just been made to Abram, and he has been moving about its various territories. His worship has expressed his gratitude to God, but now this land of promise cannot support him. The repetition of famine language in verse, in verse 10 stresses its severity. He must move out of the land in order to survive. And I add this theme of riding the edge of a promise that we discussed last week with the promise never quite actualizing will come back again and again and again in the narrative going forward throughout not only Genesis, but into the book of Exodus and beyond. So they go to Egypt and this will be a theme in the Torah. Generations later, Jacob will find himself in a similar bind. You can read about that in Genesis 41, and we will get there eventually. And he sends his son to Egypt to procure food. It's part of the Joseph and the Coat of Many Colors novella. Freinlein writes, historically journeys from Canaan to Egypt at a time of famine, usually occasioned by drought, are known from Egyptian sources. And so the, these stories also come from extra biblical sources. And this is because the Nile Delta was exceptionally fertile and able to sustain life. Every year, the banks of the Nile would flood and, and water would go out about a mile on each direction of the Nile and it would carry rich fertile soil out of the, the Nile and deposit it as the waters receded along the banks, leaving an ever replenishing supply of fertile land. And so as a result, Egypt was considered the bread basket of the Mediterranean world, writes Hebert in the Common English Bible Commentary. Uh, it's been said by more than one person, I don't know who first said it, that, e that Egypt was a gift of the Nile. And that was one of the reasons it was so long lasting, because it had this um, river that would consistently, constantly keep the soil churning to have um, rich farmland. So this is why people go to Egypt when there's a famine. Before we move on, I want to make mention of one significant detail. Abram is in Egypt as an alien migrant. The word used to describe migrants from other countries today comes straight from English Bible translations. But most often, the heroes in the biblical stories find themselves as outsiders looking in. They're usually the ones who are the migrants or the, so or the sojourners or those who are in transit um, in, in, in places that are unfamiliar. 
And the lessons learned as migrant aliens will inform them going forward as it relates to how Israel should treat foreigners among them. An example of this comes from Exodus chapter 23. And this is just one example of things like this being said. This happens in the same conversation the Israelites are, or Moses is having with God on the mountain, the same conversation in which he receives the Ten Commandments. And another thing that he is told on the mountaintop is, you shall not oppress a resident alien. You know the heart of an alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. Reminding them of the lessons they learned while they were foreigners in a strange land. It's almost as if to say only those who have had this experience um, can, can, can find the compassion necessary uh, to, to, to treat foreigners well. It's a lesson the Israelites learned again and again. So here's, <laughs> here's where it gets really dicey. Um, verse 11. When he, Abram, was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know well that you are a woman, beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that it may go well with me because of you, and that my life may be spared on your account. This is but one of three such stories in the book of Genesis. And I'm going to quote Hendel, who writes the commentary in my Harper study Bible, Harper Collins study Bible. He writes, the story of the matriarch in danger occurs in three varying forms. Here with Abram and Sarai in Egypt, and this is from the Yahwist source, as we've been talking about these different sources. Uh, but then in chapter 20 with Abraham and Sarai in Gerar, that's an Elohist source, biblical scholars think based on the language. And then in 26, 6 through 11 with Isaac and Rebekah, also in Gerar, also with the same man, Abimelech, as is the second time this is told, in, in the first time it's told in Gerar. Um, so each story expresses a threat to the promise of progenity that is narrowly averted in each of the patriarch, in each the, the patriarch uses the ruse that the woman is really a sister so that he will not be killed because of her beauty. This all begins because Abram is suspicious from the onset, afraid that the Egyptians, from the vantage point of the outsider and migrant, are going to treat him wrongly, perhaps kill him. However, Abram's anxiety at this point is purely speculative, as is so much of our anxiety, I might add. We do not know why he fears the Egyptians or if his fears are founded on any real evidence. And keep in mind, this is in the book of Genesis, not in the book of Exodus where the Israelites are treated so poorly. Egypt in the book of Genesis is, in every, in every instance I could find, um, cast in a positive light. So we don't know why he is afraid of, we don't know why he's afraid of the Egyptians. Notice Sarai is never given a voice. Abram tells her what to do. And Abram's motives are purely selfish and self-seeking. He names his motive so that it may go well with me because of you and that my life might be spared on your account. It doesn't get any more blunt than that. Verse 14, when Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. When the officials of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt well with Abram. And he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female slaves, female donkeys, and camels. Freinlein writes, Abram's premonitions about Egypt are on target in some respects. Both the populace and the officials of the unnamed Pharaoh do make the anticipated judgment about Sarai's beauty. But I go on to add, it's a bit odd that a king would want to take such an older woman into his harem. She was 65. You can do the math by finding her age in Genesis 17, 17 and and, and do the math and discover the story. She's about 65 years old. So you're, you're not, I'm not quite sure what to make of this detail. Uh, perhaps she only served as a bargaining chip in exchange for Abram's enrichment because a, a king wanted to bring people into, women into his harem who would make children for him. 
And we already know that Sarai is barren and she is advanced in years at this point. Um, and so it's hard to understand why the, the king would want her in, in his harem, unless maybe it was this sort of um, give and take. And, and that's sadly one of the ways, one of the reasons why marriages happen. Um, women were seen as an exchange, a one, one pawn in an exchange of, of other goods um, or, or treaties were, were um, brokered this way. Um, and women uh, without volition or say were, were used in this way. But either way, um, Abram was treated with safety, livestock, and slaves at the expense of Sarai. There's no getting around this uncomfortable fact. Abram traded his wife for safety and property. What a great guy. And what was his end game? Uh, we know, because if you've read to the end of the story, that he, he gets his wife back and, and, and then some. But he doesn't know that from the onset. And all of this is done without the consultation or consent of Sarai, so far as we can tell. She was a pawn in a patriarchal age. Here's one cynical thought. This is my cynical thought. Perhaps Abram thought that his actions would open the way to progeny and prosperity. New wives, new wealth, new possibilities. We find out later that one of the slaves that he gets in this transaction is, is Hagar, who mothers one of his children, um, Ishmael. But this is pure speculation. It all depends on um, what, what Abram meant by so that they will do well by me in the previous in the previous so so that it may go well with me because of you and um, there's a lot you could read into that that sentence and we can't really know verse 17 but the lord afflicted pharaoh in his house with great plagues because of sarai abram's wife so pharaoh called abram and said what is this you have done to me why did you not tell me that she was your wife why did you say she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? It would, we would do well to rewind the tape at this point and remember what came just before the story, the stuff we talked about last week, where the Lord God said to Abram, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Genesis 12, 2 through 3. Now, the one who is called to be a blessing has instead brought a curse. Freinlein writes in the New Interpreter's Bible commentary, Abram brings a curse rather than a blessing upon the nations. In his very first contact with outsiders, Abram fails in his response to the call of God. Literally, the next chapter, and we have this, this failure. Verses 18 and then repeated in 19. Why did you say she is my sister? Notice Pharaoh is emphatic. He repeats it twice for emphasis. Now that the cat is out of the bag, we are about to learn if Abram's initial fears were founded. Remember, this whole plot was contrived because Abram was afraid that he would be treated poorly or perhaps killed. Will Abram indeed be killed on foreign soil, an unwelcome migrant? Pharaoh may well decide to keep Sarai, for all we know, or at the very least, take back all the livestock and slaves that have been given Abram. You could certainly understand why he would uh, want to, especially since that those gifts were given um, in the context of deception on Abram's part. But this is what happens. Here's Pharaoh still talking. Now then, here is your wife. Take her and be gone. And Pharaoh gave his men orders concerning him, and they set him on the way with his wife and all that he had. You can almost imagine them walking him back to the border of Canaan. Freinlein writes, Abram expects the worst from the outsider. From the way Pharaoh responds when the ruse becomes known, it seems unlikely he would have mistreated or killed Abram if he had told the truth from the beginning. Pharaoh would have done, would have been well within his rights if he had decided to exact vengeance or at least taken back the goods that had been lavished on Abram. Instead, the one who brought a curse on the house of Pharaoh leaves with undeserved blessing. Ironically, writes Freinlein, Pharaoh proves to be more of a moral behavioral model in this instance than Abram. 
alleviating the negative consequences that might well have befallen Abram. One last thing I want to point out that I think is neat. We find in these few verses, these 10 verses, a parallel for what will happen later in the end of Genesis and then on into Exodus, spanning the whole whole back third of the book of Genesis and then a substantial part of the book of Exodus. And I've put the two parallel parallel passages from each of the stories side by side. Actually, I did it. This comes from the New Expositor's Bible Commentary. I took a picture of it to show you the similarities and even the language where it begins with famine, then a trip to Egypt in both cases, Abram and, and then Joseph, a request for help in that context from Abram and then Joseph, help given in both instances, and then plagues, in Abram's case, brought on by his own subterfuge and deception, in the case of, at that point, Moses, because of the hard-heartedness of, of the Pharaoh, then there's this falling out, again, for different reasons, and then an exodus from Egypt, and in both cases, the people, and in our story today, Abram, leave with more than they brought. Some takeaways. As I said earlier, this is a story about what not to do, how not to behave. Abram, putting his own life and well-being ahead of everyone else, especially Sarai, tells Sarai to throw herself under the bus on his behalf. He is very clear on this point. Sarai has no text, no voice in this text, nor volition. This reflects a patriarchal age when women were treated as property or pawns in the machinations of men. They were married off in exchange for property. When unmarried, they were viewed as liabilities. Pharaoh, point three, is outraged because he was tricked into adultery. Curses aside, things would certainly have been different had Sarai Sarai not been Abram's wife. A brief quote on adultery in the Hebrew Bible from Miguel de la Torre. He writes, in the Hebrew scriptures, a man was was guilty only if he had sexual relationships with another man's wife, that is, another man's possession. With this one exception, a married man was free to engage in sexual relationships with non-married women. So, um, uh, the reason why adultery was scandalous in the biblical worldview of the, of the Hebrew scriptures is, is because she is the man's, the man's property. Um, this becomes clear also in the Ten Commandments where um, in the commandment not to covet, coveting a man's wife is listed right along with the oxen and other things that a, a man might possess, even in the Ten Commandments. That's the way it reads. Pharaoh comes off well in the story. In fact, point four, I'm reading from point four now. He comes off well in the story. In fact, Egypt continues to be viewed in a positive light until Exodus. Throughout the book of Genesis, Egypt is cast in in a positive light. Pharaoh is shown to be generous in his gift gilding, albeit in exchange for a new woman for his no doubt extensive harem. Abram's fears were unfounded One wonders how things might have been if he had relied on the good nature of strangers. How might things have turned out if Abram was more determined to be a blessing to Egypt? His fear and paranoia drove him to reckless self-seeking action at the expense of his wife. There is a lesson here. Fear, anxiety, and paranoia about those outside of our tribe often bring bad results. Final takeaway. First, a long quote from Feinlein. The chosen ones are not inevitably the bringers of blessing to others. They can so comport themselves in daily life that others will suffer rather than be blessed. How the people of God respond to others has great potential for both good and ill. Benevolent behavior by those who are not chosen testifies to the continuing work of God the creator in the lives of all people. Those who are instruments of God's redemptive activity ought to recognize these wide-ranging positive effects of God's creative work and seek to join hands with such persons in working toward God's goals of a reclaimed creation. The most basic root of these problematic ways of relating to others, according to this text, lies in a deeply rooted centering on self. I believe that we are still seeing aspects of this story reverberate today 
Women are still subjugated to men in many spheres and are not given a voice. Humans are still prone to paranoia driven by self-seeking, selfish, and, self and, and a self-preservation streak that drives us to protect ourselves and interests at any cost. This plays out at the collective level as idolatrous nationalism, as well as on an individual basis. If we focused on ways to be a blessing wherever we go and lead with trust, things would go far better for us as individuals and as communities. Bringing everyone back, you might unmute yourselves. I'll go ahead and ask you to unmute. So how many of you were familiar with that story? Yes. Yeah. Not. Yeah, it's, it's not, it's, it's, you, you won't hear it preached from a pulpit. I think it's because of the way it reflects un, in an unflattering way on Abram, probably. So it also know. happens again. Yes. He didn't learn the first time. Yes, um, yeah. yes, and then yeah. and then his son Jacob, with the same in the same location, probably with the same person, in the biblical narrative, lies and and same same so basic story. It's without the curses in those stories. They just uh, sort of figure it out or find out some in some way. Yeah, I uh, was troubled by this story uh, in the ways that you outlined, and I also. I was trying to assign any kind of positive motivation for this uh, that I could. And I, I wondered, you know, after being given this charter that uh, Abram would be a blessing to uh, was it the generations, whatever he was given by God. Um, all families. All families. Okay. All families. I wondered if he felt so singularly important to the generations that, and with this fear, that he felt he needed to sacrifice Sarai um, and rather than protect her. I mean, there are two choices, right? He could either go down with her and die, you know, protecting her, or he could embark on this ruse and say, I have a, I have a God-given duty to survive this. You know, I have to survive the famine and I have to survive being in Egypt, and I have a fear that the Pharaoh is going to take me out, uh, even though that wasn't fact-based probably. But I don't know that his goal was to be enriched. I don't know. I'm trying to give the guy a break. But, um, <laughs> you know, he did have this faith. He built these altars where he went. Uh, he has God's ear. You know, he, can, he, he speaks to God, and God gave him this charter and so, you know, I don't know. I, am, I, I, don't, I, I don't like this story. I don't like the fact that women were treated this way. Um, and, uh, uh, but uh, I'm, try, I'm trying to give him a break. So that did, that did occur to me. It may not be in any of the writings that you have uh, summarized there, but just, just wanted to put that out there. No, what you said is actually in, um, I've, more than one commentary I read, Offered, posited that as a possibility. This mm -hmm. is a story with so many gaps and, and a good commentary won't assert anything with confidence, but, but like toy out some plausible explanations that we just really can't get at the bottom of. And that's one of them. Um, and, and that, he, that his survival was key and he was trying to keep the promise alive by surviving. And, and at this point, the promise does not include Sarah. Later, they are told that Sarai would be definitely the one. At this point in the narrative, we don't know that. And so um, I did a very cynical speculation that did not help. It did not um, I think to... for me, um, there's two things that we need to think about. If, if we know a little bit more down the road with Sarai, we, when she becomes Sarah, we know with, uh, it's Hagar is the servant that has the, his child. And she's very vocal that she wants her gone. And he, he agrees. So I, I'm not sure that Sarai disagreed with what 
he was doing if she were that set against it, I think she it would be vocalized as such. And for me, this story says um, nothing about Abram going to the Lord and asking what to do. Uh, he just decides, as far as we know from the story, he just decides for himself that this is what he's going to do to, to save his, his family. And instead of, again, going to the Lord and asking for protection or instructions as what to do, he just goes out on his own. And um, because of that, it could create problems. And in, it, it just says to me that when we have issues, we need to go to the Lord or we need to go to the word and, and look for instructions, which I don't think he did. Like as to, to Judy's last point, that's enough, what you just said is, is also in several of the commentaries as one of those plausible speculations. There is no, there is no reference to, to God in the story, no consultation, mm. except for the, the curses that come would include, would include God, but there's no, there's no back and forth or dialogue between Abram and God. Um, and he, he had just been making sacrifices and altars to Yahweh. Then he leaves and then he comes back and that's the first thing he does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When he gets back to Canaan, that's the first thing yeah. he does. Yeah. Right. Right. So and actually he was blessed because of this. He, he came back wealthier than he went. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and the Lord seems to be acting on his behalf by resolving the situation in spite of all of these error. I mean, I would call them errors of faith, maybe. I mean, he cursed the Pharaoh and kind of spurred the Pharaoh into action to get Sarai back in Abram's by his side and get them out of Egypt, maybe. I mean, that that's, that's what we've, according to uh, what the Lord said to Abram before, then we would say that the curses were part of that covenant. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. And this doesn't explain to us how the Pharaoh found out. Um, it, that's except, true in all except three. For the, the illness, there was illness in the thing, but, but still it doesn't say because of the illness he found out that she was the cause. I mean, that, that's it doesn't true. Tell all three tellings of the story, which uh, by the way, have, you know, they're, they're virtually identical without, without, I mean, it, they're about the same length. They're about the, a lot of the same verbiage, just different locations. And in, in one case, different people being um, I, Isaac and Rebecca. Um, and that's always the case. Abimelech in the other stories finds out, like, and it's not very clear how that's made known. And the person who was being um, duped is morally outraged at the deception and sends them packing with things, with gifts and whatnot. Um, was it Isaac, the one that was, was they they saw him and Rebecca together. Is that the one? One of them, they were being affectionate. You know, I think you're right. Thought. That's in 29. I could look it up right now. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's in... There aren't very many Isaac stories. Actually, As you're like looking it up, as you're looking it up, doesn't it kind of say that poor God has to use these men with all their sins and all this stuff and finally has to use the woman to save the guy in the end, even though she was badly treated? 
So I think that gives us hope that we who are such sinners and selfish, egotistical stuff, that God still uses us, that we still have a purpose in, you know, in God's great plan, whatever it may be. We just have to watch out for karma. It doesn't come back to haunt us when we do bad things. But, but I, I would have to say kudos to you, God, or maybe God changed God his or her mind. Well, it, it does always seem that the, the women in these stories, when women do come out in these stories, it's, it's, in, it's in defiance of the, um, the, the war making and machinations of, of, of the, the patriarchs moving things around. But I did find, I did find it, um, and you're right, they were laughing. It says they were laughing. Okay. And that was what that was what tipped him off in um, when it relates to Isaac and um, Rebecca. Right. And then in 12, it said that serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household were because of Abraham's wife. Mm -hmm. So. Well, I'm going to pull this. <sighs> It was a short story today and a short lesson. Um, I've been trying to keep them a little shorter to provide more time for, for, for conversation like we had last week. I think that's good. Um, I had some lessons that were like 45 minutes of just monologue earlier on. And, and, and we found ourselves an hour into the lessons wanting to hop off fairly quickly. Um, so last thoughts or concluding remarks? Do you, do you think most people come to this conclusion that um, fear and paranoia of people on the outside um, can, you know, bring chaos and, and curses to others? I mean, this, this sort of uh, moral behavioral model of the Pharaoh being that kind of, <laughs> being the model in this story is, um, it's pretty remarkable, but do people like get that when they when they read this story? That came from the the commentaries the that I read, which are pretty but it's, but it's pretty pretty clear. I mean, it's I think it's it was um, clear to me when I read. I mean, we, I'm not like a biblical scholar. It's pretty pretty clear to me. We we get the Egypt of the Book of Exodus all tangled up with yeah. the Egypt. Egypt we read in, uh, in the book of Genesis. And in the book of Genesis, um, it's where Joseph is made the, the right hand of the Pharaoh. Uh, this mm -hmm. and, and all of his, Joseph's family is brought in and, and you're given the uh, impression, that, you know, exactly how many years passed between then and Exodus. But by the time Exodus comes, it says that the, there was a new Pharaoh in the land who did not know about Joseph or something like that. And um, I believe that the, the Pharaoh talked about in Exodus was Ramses II, um, which the character of the, 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 the Pharaoh we find in um, Exodus matches the historical character of that, um, of that Pharaoh. So is it, it true or is it just my imagination that in many places in the Bible that Egypt is thought of as a, quote, evil uh, country or nation. It depends is, on, it depends, not yet, not in Genesis. In I'm Exodus, just, they are the, they are the empire of that time. And then later in the prophets, it will shift to Babylon and Persia, Assyria. Uh, well, pretty soon it's about to make a shift to um, um, Philist the Philistines and the people that are in, in Canaan, Cana at the time. Um, and then though, remember in Matthew, um, it's to Egypt that they, that, that Joseph and Mary flee to mm -hmm. in fear of another despot, Herod, Herod the Great. Um, but God so, did tell them to go there. And it, it, but it, finding respite in Egypt, it fits that motif. Yeah. So both, right. both are true depending on where you're reading and what yeah. period in, in the narrative you're talking about. 
Yeah, I just wonder if we can apply it to today. I mean, with all the <sighs> emotions, stresses that are going on in this world today, we, if we go into these environments where people live the way or think the way that we don't, then that can influence us and can draw us away from God or change our thinking about God. I think it's a, a warning to, to be careful where you go. I don't know. That's just me. <laughs> I heard about Wisconsin this morning and it's just <sighs> the the parents of this individual are saying we want peace. We don't want this. And they continue to be violent. And I just think that in our culture today, sometimes we let people influence us in the wrong way because of safety or preservation, whatever you want to call it. And I just think that here's a situation where Abram was trying to protect himself and got in trouble. I do think it's a situation where Abram was trying to protect himself and got in trouble. The the situation in Wisconsin, the, the video is, is fairly straightforward. There's a man shot in the back while the officer was pulling the shirt. There's another angle too that shows all of the, the children that were present. There's so many ways that could have gone wrong. Yeah. Um, the rioting in the streets is a result of a lack of breakdown in trust from the onset. Um, it almost doesn't matter what, the, what actually happened in these shootings anymore. It, is the, it comes from the deep-seated belief that nothing will be done about it if, in fact, it's found out that um, there was police misconduct. And then last night, uh, a, a white man with a rifle who was like a mil like we think was probably a militant of some kind, um, they're describing him as a militia man, shot and killed two of the protesters and wounded a third. Mm -hmm. So violence begets violence begets violence, and it really stems from this issue of trust and when there's no justice whether you condemn the violence or for the violence we can all agree there's no peace i don't i'm not for the violence just to be clear um i would not participate in it myself but if there were justice and relate bridges of trust built from the onset um it, we would be in different a different time in in our history um that's that's why I emphasize it, um, Abram. If he had not entered into this inter interaction with a different people of a different na nationality, different tribe, in paranoia or fear, um, it would have it would have at, at least um, opened up channels for dialogue, curiosity. At the very worst, Abram's fears might have been realized, and he might have been killed. But as a Christian, I believe there are worse things than dying. If it, in other words, my hands shedding the blood or my hands participating in the violence. It's mm -hmm. a conviction I hold. And even if I don't live to benefit um, from my peaceful ways, it's my hope that the model will um, inspire others. And, and, and the deaths of martyrs often will do that. And not that I want to be a martyr. I hope I'm not a martyr. I really hope I never, never am, but that's my approach to it. And we'll, we'll see, we'll see what yeah. happens. Well, it was definitely a situation that could have gone astray, but God took care of it. In Abram's case? Yeah, in yeah. Abram's case. Yeah, yeah. I think we can say that. A Which situation about that could have gone astray, but God, God protected him. It says something about God's grace in spite of our own. Yeah. Ways. Well, Paul Hart, the revivalists used to say, after they said, 
I see that hand. I see that hand. If our hearts are cleared, um, <laughs> I want to <laughs> sign off. Um, thank you all. Um, okay. I'll post the recording for those who, who missed it. And thank you for your feedback and your comments. And next, we'll, we'll cover all of Genesis chapter 13. And it won't be, it won't be a long, we're going to skim over some things quickly and then hit on a few points um, at, at more depth. Okay. So until next week. Fantastic. Thank you care. so much. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.